quit having such a negative bias about the interest. <laughs> right, right. Right. Hey guys. Stop it. <laughs> hey guys. <laughs> <laughs> Hey guys, welcome back to another therapy talk. Again, we're here with uh, Janice uh, talking communication. So we're in chapter three. So excited to get back into it. Uh, today, we're going to talk about a little thing called negativity bias. And so we'll uh, get right into it. I hope you guys enjoy this episode and let's get to it. Can I still feel grounded in these belief systems and entertain other ideas? Finally, they sent me to prison. That was it for me. From that point forward, I will do whatever it takes. This is not the life that I want. This is a thinking disease with a using problem. They're not bad people learning how to be good. You're sick and learning how to be well. We're back. Chapter three on communication. So today we want to talk about our brain's tendency to pay attention to the negative um, and then mm -hmm. how that might affect us. One of the things that I wanted to talk about today was cognitive thinking errors, how they affect us. And the biggest one that I thought we should talk about is the brain's tendency to filter out the positive. I mean, let's just go with like a boss and an employee. I, as somebody's boss, maybe have eight communications with them in a day. Typically, the one that people are going to remember and, and equate me to in the relational context that we were kind of talking about in our last segment is the one negative thing that I said to them in those eight different communications. The brain has a tendency to filter out the positive things, and it's, it's this really super fun trick that our, that our brain plays on us where it more readily accepts negative information than positive information. I mean, you know, gossip travels at the speed of light, but try to try to put some good news through the grapevine at the same rate and it'll never happen. Right. You know, it, it, we got to be flexible, you know, so mm -hmm. that's important. So you're, you're talking about the negativity bias. So that our brain, mm -hmm. one of my favorite sayings is that, Negative experiences are like Velcro. Positive experiences are like Teflon. They just slip right off. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, I think for, for the listener that there's actually some really good reason why our brain pays attention to the negative and not the positive. Because the positive... Can I guess before you tell us the answer? Yeah. So my guess is that our brain doesn't remember the positive stuff because it's not a problem to be solved. There was no threat in the situation. So we don't need to remember that because there wasn't a threat to us in the situation. It is rooted in survival. So it is healthier for our brain, be aware and be alert to things that are negative because those are the things that put our survival at risk. It's safer to assume that all snakes are a rattler then and and it be a garter stake than to do the reverse and assume that all snakes are garters and then you come across that rattler and then you die so i firmly follow that advice in everyday life belts on the floor snake stick in the grass snake everything's a snake right. and they're all going to kill me <laughs> right <laughs> it, it, i mean it leaves you it leaves you pretty stressed in the world but at least you're going to survive right where i think that becomes a problem is is people who've got a lot of trauma and a lot of adversity in their life and don't have a lot of like if your brain is filled with lots of negative experiences and there's like a really inverted ratio where you have like tons and tons of negative experiences and very few positive experiences it's really hard to convince somebody to think positively about a situation because their brain has a different perception of the world at that point but i think you know just in anything any any time our brain is alerted to some type of difference or something new or whatever it's going to be seen as negative or threatening first until you prove me otherwise. Mm -hmm. And so chances are even our first attempt at listening to somebody, we're probably going to take it in a negative way and maybe respond a little defensively. Defensively, I mean, I'm sure people can kind of relate to those times where you react to some way, someone, something somebody said, and then that person's like, no, that's not what I meant. I meant what I was saying is this. And you're like, Oh, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I just thought you meant this. Yeah. And and so our brain is ready to, to pounce on. So I think, mm -hmm. you know, even if you think in communication, it makes sense that Facebook and all social media is flooded with negative articles, negative things, because our brain just really gravitates towards that. And the idea that we could see see it differently is threatening. Like 
do I really want to buy into this article that says that what I've been seeing for so many days is wrong or, you know, that any information well, is I mean, different. Yeah. And not just that. I mean, for anybody who hasn't had the chance to watch the social dilemma on Netflix, there um, is some very interesting uh, information and like context about how social media works and why things end up on our newsfeed. And um, essentially all those platforms are doing is just trying to reassure us that we are correct. They're trying to give us things similar to other things that we have engaged with before. So if something comes up on our Facebook feed, we clicked on the article and maybe we read the whole thing or we shared the post because we thought that it was important information other people needed, or we tagged somebody in the comments, anything like that, that engagement, social media companies store that. And then they use the stuff that we've engaged with in the past to figure out how to keep us on their platforms for a longer period of time, because that's how they make money. They're doing their job. The, the negativity bias and the specific cognitive distortion of filtering out the positive can do a lot of damage to our relationships. If, if you don't know to check yourself for it, it can absolutely decimate your view of yourself, which is going to impact the way that you communicate with other people. So like a, another like benign kind of easy example of filtering out the positive. If you say you're in high school, you have multiple classes, nine class periods throughout the day, you do really well in science, but you fail to quiz for some reason in science. The negativity bias, along with a couple other ones, is going to want you to believe that you are now bad at science because you got a bad grade of failing grade on a test. I'm bad at science. Um, we only we only remember that we failed. We don't remember all of the other ones that we passed, all of the all of the success that we've had in that class before. As we get older and as we start to have interpersonal, deep interpersonal relationships with other people, we learn more about ourselves and who we are and how we fit into the world. When we have negative social interactions from peers, from other people, sometimes we let our brain believe that negative thing about ourselves. And if I feel like I, other people have told me enough negative things about myself, even though there may be just as many positive things, my brain is more likely to remember the negative things that people said to me. And if I don't have the tools I'm not going to filter out those messages as untrue about myself. And if I believe that I am not a fun person to be around somebody that people don't want to spend time with, I mean, people say awful things to each other. If I, if I start to believe those things about myself, I'm not likely to be a very good communicator. Even if I do happen to find the bravery one day to engage in a conversation with somebody, I'm going to have a lot of problems because my brain's tricked itself into not thinking very good things about me. Like our brains are, our brains are filled with different filing cabinets and each filing cabinet has like a general theme. So like family relationships work as we get older, like the file cabinets have to grow because we have more experiences and in the filing cabinets is memories, hopefully good and bad that when we experience a situation in psychology, we call them schemas this is similar. This is the same thing we're talking about. When we experience a new situation or we go to a place we haven't been before, or we're with a person we haven't been with before, our brain rolls through all of our filing cabinets and tries to find the most similar experience that it's had before. It whips out that file folder and basically gives it to your brain like this is the situation that we are in now. We didn't have a problem before, so we can behave the same way. We won't have a problem again. We had a problem before. This is something we should be afraid of. If we have a kid that's been through a lot of rejection and doesn't have good relationships, has poor relational health, and, and you're a, like a teacher or a counselor and, and you say to that kid, you know, mm -hmm. wow, you, you're, really, you're really smart or you did a really good thing or you're a really good person or I really like you or typically that kid's response is, okay, that's what you're supposed to say. Like, I don't buy it. I remember your story you shared it with me multiple times about how you were working with foster families and kids who had been just through it. Mm -hmm. No real positive regard shown to them ever showing up to a house where a perfect stranger greets them with an overwhelming amount of genuine, unconditional love. And it's verbalized and how uncomfortable that makes them because 
there's there's no context for the cognitive message yeah it goes you know it's like so you're you're comparing it to previous experience and going that doesn't match so something's up it's kind of that same like waiting for the other shoe to drop like okay this this feels good but I don't really trust it. So I got to still stay on edge and I got to still, you know, you're being nice to me, but I'm just waiting for you to kind of like throw the bomb down where you're going to be mean to me or, and I think about people that suffer from depression, the brain doesn't naturally think positively. It's not an easy thing for it to do. So you actually have to consciously structure and create this new habit. Like you have to create this new template in your brain that I'm going to think positively about my life, think positively about myself. I'm going to make effort to focus on the good things in my day. Even if it's little, even if it's like, oh, I had really good breakfast. I'm going to, I'm going to spend time bathing in that positive experience instead of spending my whole day reflecting on how awful it was. And I, you know, I deal with that with some clients right now where it's like, I have this one positive experience. It's good. It felt good, but you know what? It, it's not going to last. It's it's going to only be amount of time before that person changes the way who she is that day, mm-hmm. you know, and it's yeah. going to be bad. And one of the most powerful antidotes to the brain's negativity bias and the cognitive distortion of filtering out the positive that I've really ever seen consistently be successful are gratitude lists. When you feel negative, when you feel down, when you feel yourself getting a little like Mr. Scrooge in your head about your everyday life, instead of just Christmas, taking a second and writing down, physically writing down, maybe just a handful of things, three things that you're grateful for. I've had clients who have written down things like, I'm grateful that my lungs are healthy enough to breathe oxygen. I'm grateful I can trust my mind today. I'm grateful that I woke up today, even though I'm struggling with some really heavy issues, some really heavy thoughts, some really heavy feelings. I'm grateful I woke up today because maybe this day will be better than yesterday. We attended a training by this group called Original Strength. They talked about movement is you, it's good, better, or best. Like your starting point is a, a place of good, And then, Mm -hmm. then you move. So even at your worst ability to move your most biggest struggle, it's a place of good because the fact that you can move anyway is a place of good. And then it can only get better from there. And so I think of even just in, in your gratitude, even if it's, I'm just glad I woke up today, Mm -hmm. that's a place of good. It might not be the, the gratitude that you want for that day. Like you wish it was more than that, but at least it starts somewhere and, and it gets your brain yeah. thinking and processing in, in, in that positive way. Cause you have to change, you have to change the template. And so you can't really, it's hard to erase or get rid of the template except for, unless you have like a lobotomy or something, but, <laughs> but you can stop. Which using. we are not recommending. No. We are not recommending. <laughs> so, but <laughs> you can stop using that network, you know, to a certain degree or incredibly dampen it and increase and create this new template and new network and just keep strengthening that network. You can't just drop the one you have to, if you're going to drop the one, you have to actively be working on building something, another, another place right. for those thoughts and feelings to go. Oh, absolutely. Kind of, kind of same way as like, okay, tell the, tell the addict to stop using but then them not have any other options in place. Mm-hmm. Like you can't, it's just not, it's not as simple as that. AA talks a lot about this, about like stinking thinking, like just in yep. kind of like you get into these ruts of the way you think. And then that thinking leads to maybe more, you know, lapse and relapse and, you know, mm-hmm. things like that. Addiction of any kind, whether it's a behavioral addiction, like gambling or a chemical addiction, like alcoholism or drug addiction, it's a thinking problem with a using consequence like unless unless your mind allows you to think that that certain things are okay and acceptable and and safe you don't do them so in order to stop the behavior the only thing that we have control of oftentimes is our thoughts we may not have control over the way that we feel about a situation or way a situation makes us feel if we put our minds to it we can typically find some amount of control in the way that we're thinking. And it seems very opposite. Um, 
but I feel like I am, I am the strongest. I am the most capable when I recognize that I do not have control and there is nothing I can do about the situation. And so in that moment, I am no longer, like we talked about last time in metaphor of the ice cream cone and then the scoop of ice cream on top being the kind of two different levels of the brain, the the surviving brain and the thinking brain. If I don't admit that I do not have control over a situation, I stay down in the ice cream cone. I stay down in my survival brain because I'm trying to solve problems, but I'm not doing it very effectively. When I let go of my desire to control or manipulate or be in charge, it's like all of a sudden, like here's the ice cream scoop on top. And now I have all of these different ideas, all of these different creative solutions for how to approach a problem that if I wouldn't have just, we call it drop the rock. Like the rock is whatever like character defect or unhealthy thought that lives in your head. Like if somebody ever says to me or I say to somebody else, man, you need to drop that rock. Isn't that getting heavy? I'm letting you know that I see some dysfunction in the way that you're thinking. And most of the time, a lot of that dysfunction is all geared toward negative thinking, that negativity bias. I always say rigidity is bad for survival. So the more rigid we are, the worse we, you know, the more susceptible we are to things. Mm-hmm. Just hearing you say trying to control everything makes me think that, gosh, that would be really hard to try to control everything because everything's so unpredictable sometimes. And it's not about controlling everything. It's about controlling yourself. It's about focusing on you. Now, that doesn't mean to ignore everybody, but it's like, okay, who do I have? What do I have control over in these moments? I have control over Mm -hmm. how I respond, how I take care of myself versus I got to control the way they speak to me. I got to control the way they approach me. I got to control everything about my day, you know, instead of just being flexible to kind of go, okay, how do I adjust to the curveballs and adapt? And if you don't, I think that's what makes everything so crisis ridden. Like if, if, mm-hmm. if it has to be a certain way and then it's not, then it becomes way overwhelming. When everything seems out of control, remember that the only thing that you can really truly control is yourself. And to do that, you need to do things like regulate. You need to do things like engage in a wellness plan, take a little bit more time for yourself, be patient, find people and places that make you feel safe and content and maybe not happy, but just content at peace having those resources to go to when things are crazy, because, you know, when you just said, well, things are often unpredictable, things are always unpredictable. Everything outside of what comes out of my mouth is unpredictable. And sometimes even the stuff that I let slip out of my mouth is unpredictable. Who knows? To be honest with ourselves that we don't have control over anything, anything at all, except for ourselves. And that takes a very concerted amount of effort to punish ourselves or to say we're out of control because we don't do it a hundred percent all of the time. Again, another negativity trap that people fall into when they're trying to create change, when they're trying to change the way that they communicate with people, when they're trying to, you know, it's, it's new year's resolution season. So when you try to implement a new healthy habit or discontinue an unhealthy habit and you don't do it a hundred percent all of the time, Oh, I'm a failure. I can't follow through with anything. Stop that. Like be nicer to yourselves. Probably maybe what's driving that is that if I don't have anything in control, it brings up another thinking error, which is catastrophizing. Like it's the end of the yeah. world, you know, life is kind of, there's some highs, there's some lows. Sometimes, you know, it just, it's a constant journey and, and, you know, never get too comfortable when things are really high and things are going great because you're going to be faced with something that's going to throw things off, but also be hopeful of the fact that when things are really down, Mm-hmm. that it's going to go up again. So, I mean, sometimes life is like our stock market. Sometimes like our stocks are doing really well and sometimes they're, they're tanking and it does, but you know, you still don't mm-hmm. change your stocks every day. Right. You, you ride some of the, the lows out, mm-hmm. you know, cause eventually it's going to go back up. So it's the same thing in kind of life where it's like, you don't rechange your whole life because a bad thing happened two months later. It might be great you know, and so there, there's something to be said about perseverance, but I think, you know, th- there's balance, you know, that kind of grass is the greener on, on the other side where mm-hmm. make a decision. It's, it's a little bit impulsive. I think it's going to be great. And then I go there and I go, wow, I didn't realize how good I did have it 
where I was or what I was experiencing and something wasn't right at that time. And I feel like I had to make a change. It was more about making a decision based on the emotion we were experiencing and not decision based on, you know, pros and cons and things like that. What, what, what I think is going to be best for me in the long run, that type of thing. And I kind of like your stock market analogy. When you put money into the stock market, it's called an investment. And I think people forget that you can invest things other than money. We are constantly making investments on a day-to-day basis that have nothing to do with money. We are making emotional investments. We are making intellectual investments. We are investing our time. We are investing very important resources that we have a limited amount of as humans. And just the same way that with some of your stocks, things go up and things go down, but, but you hold steady because you know that this is a good long-term investment. If we look at the things that exist in our life, people, jobs, relationships, the physical environment where we live, all kinds of stuff, all of these things take a toll on us every day. Mm-hmm. Sometimes the cost of the toll is too high, but that doesn't mean that you just run away from it. Because the place that you end up may have a higher toll than the place that you left. Right. You know, there, there are relationships that I've had that go up and down, but I stick them out because I know that this is just a, a, just a tough moment. This is just, we're both going through some things that we need to work out individually so that we can be healthier together. That's a, it's a gamble. All of our relationships are a gamble. Because we never really truly know somebody's heart, never truly know somebody's intention. All we know is what they share with us. But that's where we we have to be kind enough to ourselves to let ourselves think that we deserve to be treated well. We deserve to be treated with respect. We deserve to be happy. And we have a right to create happiness for ourselves. Something that you said that kind of triggers something in my brain is I think about relationships in this negativity bias is that you have a good relationship with somebody and then it comes to an end for whatever reason, like a breakup, better or worse. But the breakup is what identifies your relationship and not any of the past experiences that were positive, like you forget or you neglect. And same thing happens with grief. Now, granted, there's a lot more things more complicated and more involved in that. But there is loss in relationships like breakups and stuff like that. You know, our tendency is to go, well, I'm not going to get into another relationship. I'm not going to give myself the opportunity to be happy again. We frequently tend to dismiss experiences that were really good or positive because it ended badly or because it ended. You know, it's not like that person that you're with was taking you through this journey just to do that at the end. It was an ongoing kind of journey that has its ups and downs and eventually got to a place where it needed to kind of end doesn't mean that any of the stuff that happened before before it was meaningless another super fun cognitive distortion called overgeneralization right and i think it's protecting and and i get it and you know from a neurological perspective i get it so there's a lot of kind of like and i always say we're we're, we're running on autopilot about 80 90 percent of the time so we have to make a concerted effort to jump out of autopilot and take control of the plane so that we can kind of go okay I need to be real. I might, I need to have some critical thought about what's going on. I need to have critical thought about this relationship and make sense of it and Mm -hmm. try to talk it out with somebody so that I can kind of move on. And, but I think it's getting people to appreciate that, that those positive experiences, even when it doesn't like those, those positive experiences do not lose value because a year later the relationship ended. When we part ways with a vehicle, like I will, I will keep my vehicles until they don't go anymore, until they just are falling apart at the seams. But when I sell the car, it doesn't leave my life with a negative memory because there were positive memories, road trips, the experience of getting it for the first time, you know, the first time that you like put back the sunroof or like, I remember (laughs) from my first car to my second car, I went from having like crank windows to like power windows and that was like oh my gosh like the day and then my first car was um a standard my second car was an automatic so that was also a very like exciting experience like those are things that i remember isn't it just awful that we are we are more balanced and more forgiving of our vehicles 
than we are of the people that we invest time, energy, and emotion into. It's just really right. unfortunate. That gratitude journal that you talk about is teaching people to appreciate the present. So appreciate the now, mm-hmm. not get too caught up into the past or too caught up into what you want for in the future. Mm-hmm. If you keep moving forward and if you keep putting a concerted effort into life, things will pattern. It's, you know, the stock market will get back to where it needs to be. Yes, it's painful. It's hurt. It's hurts. And I think there's an element of you got to kind of appreciate that too. If it didn't hurt, mm-hmm. then it wasn't a very meaningful relationship. Like if you can walk out of that relationship going, I don't really care, then you didn't really, you weren't really close or invested in that. The fact that I have a lot of pain over this loss means, man, I had a really good relationship. That That's like something that I can appreciate. It's not good right now or for whatever reason, it's not moving forward and that sucks, mm-hmm. but that doesn't mean that any of the stuff in the past wasn't good for me or positive or meaningful. There's or- nothing wrong with missing something that has no place in my life anymore. Mm-hmm. I can miss something and have a positive emotional regard towards it, but that doesn't mean that the reason that I made the decision or the circumstances that caused me to remove whatever that person, place, or thing is from my life doesn't mean that those reasons are invalid. I can have both. I can have my positive change. I can have my forward growth and I can miss and maybe think positively about experiences that I've had before. They can both exist at the same time. You mentioned missing something like, okay, I missed this relationship or I missed my car or I missed this Mm -hmm. experience. I miss what it was like to be in college or whatever that you're really... Mm -hmm thinking back that emotional experience won't last forever it'll dissipate and you will be moving on to the next experience or next emotion and stuff like that where we struggle is that we get once that emotion hits and because it's got some intensity to it we're like i gotta do something to get rid of it really fast i gotta take a pill i gotta drink i gotta harm myself. I got to do something. I got to call that person, that extremely toxic person that I got out of my life for a reason. We're not allowing our body's natural ability to just kind of flow out of it and Mm -hmm. tolerate. Like I always say, therapy is about learning how to tolerate, building resilience, being able to handle Mm -hmm. things that have intensity and sit with that emotion and go, okay, it's not going to last forever. It sucks right now, but I'm going to get through it. My oldest daughter, she, she, uh, she broke her wrists in a, in a nice, um, Christmas scooter accident. And yeah, yeah. And when, it, and when it first happened it, I mean, it was miserable for her. I mean, she obviously rightfully was miserable and for her, it felt like it was going to last forever. And, and mm-hmm. ultimately there was, there was things that we could do to kind of help her, uh, get through it. Now she's, you know, all cast up and ready to go and she's, you know, doing well, but it was painful. But I, I do believe that that's going to, she's going to grow and be strong from that because she was able to kind of work through that experience. There's things that we can learn and grow from, from that negative emotion and experience. Like there's Mm -hmm. a reason why we have it. There's a reason why we have negative emotions that it's purposeful. There's, there is a reason for it. So we should, we should respect that. A resource that we use all of the time in clinical side of recovery services at the agency. Um, It's a fellow named father Martin and he did a series of talks and Father Martin, who was a Catholic priest, expresses a sentiment and the, the audience was a group of people who were there to learn about how to deal with addicts and alcoholics. The end of it is, you know, I, I hope that you have sunny days, but not without the cooling shade of a tree. I hope that you have success and happiness, but not without the sting of failure. Like it is... It's an old, um, I believe it's an old Irish blessing. And as I heard that, it really, it was a point in my life where I guess I just needed to hear something like that. And so that's really stuck with me. And as you're talking about the ups and the downs and tolerating the waves of life, it brings great comfort to me often that everything is temporary. Everything, not some things, not most things, not the things that upset me or the things that make me happy. Everything is temporary. So I need to enjoy and lean into the moments that bring me positivity and I need to have hope and an open mind when I'm in a bad time that I can't, it can't stay like this forever because everything is temporary. 
So there's mm-hmm. no point in investing. There's no point in getting hopeless. There's no point in letting my mind get stuck in that negativity bias, filtering out the positive. That's not a healthy place to let my brain live. We have this, we also have this saying in treatment, um, you're allowed to have negative thoughts, but you, you're not allowed to serve them tea. Right. They're, they are well, they are allowed to occur to you, but you are not allowed to encourage them to stick around and and plant roots. You're not going to think positively about somebody all the time. You're not going to think positively about yourself all the time. What are you going to do with those negative thoughts? How are you going to handle well, those? And I think that, that that brings up an interesting point is that, you know, not all of our thoughts are purposeful. So they're, they're thoughts that just automatically generate in our head. They just pop mm-hmm. in our head. Mm-hmm. We had no control over that. Yep. It's just something yep. triggered something and it entered into it. So it doesn't mean that we have to, just because we have the thought that it's gold and that it's, we should be following it blindly or whatever. We're allowed to question our thoughts. Like we're allowed to kind of go, is that really what I should follow or what I should think? People deal with that all the time where it's like automatic negative thoughts, we call them ants. They pop in their head of I'm a bad person or I'm worthless or, you know, all these kind of negative statements. And then people will buy right into that because if I thought it, it must be true. We have to train ourselves to kind of go, okay, that's just a, it's a negative thought. I'm not, I'm going to, I'm not going to give it attention. I'm not going to serve it to you, like you said, and I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to take control of the plane a little bit more and not allow these Mm -hmm. ants to run my life. Um, That reminds me of an experience I had while I was at undergrad at Ohio state. I was in, I think I was in like my intro to counseling class. The professor was talking about positive psychology. And I was like, this seems like a bunch of like hippie tree hugging nonsense. (laughs) This just would whatever. And at the time I had some ants, um, not necessarily about myself. They were very judgmental and very negative towards other people, particularly other women and the way that they presented themselves in the form of clothing and everything else. And so I made a deal with myself. I said, for 30 days, Janice, for 30 days. Every time you see a female and your brain creates one of those nasty automatic thoughts, you have to pair it with something positive about that person that you've just passed a judgment on. And after 30 days of doing it purposefully, I still, to this day, you know, I'll be out in public and somebody will make a comment about a woman and and how she's dressed and, that doesn't fit her. I can't believe she wore that. And my automatic thought that still now sticks with me is like, gosh, I wish I had that kind of confidence. I wish I had that kind of confidence about myself. Can you imagine how unstoppable I would be if I didn't, if I just, if I looked at myself and I said, you look beautiful, no matter what, don't let them see you down, wear what you want, live your best life. I would be unstoppable. I use that story help to try to teach people who are dealing with their own ants, their own automatic negative thoughts. The task is pairing something positive with the negative automatic thought. You don't have to believe it. You don't have to like it. Just practice doing it. Almost like 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 you're building a library of books. Eventually, your library will be 50-50. And you may even choose at some point to pick up one of those positive books and invest in those positive books instead of picking up a negative book and investing in that. We don't have to believe them to start out with. I know I certainly did it when I started my experiment to prove my college professor wrong, but it was really helpful for me to understand the incredible, incredible amount of power that negative thoughts have over us. So you were able to recognize, okay, this isn't the way I really want to kind of view the world. So Mm -hmm. I gotta, I gotta see it from a different lens. And you try to find that, those lenses, those glasses that'll kind of share that. And you're growing from that and you're learning from that. And you're the person you want to be as a result of that. How can we recognize those things in ourselves so that we can make that change? Like how, how can we recognize when those negative thoughts, when we say, oh, you know, the way I'm thinking right now, not doing a good job for me. Or if you, if you have like a, a healthy, supportive person around you that you trust to give you like honest, you know, respectful feedback. It could, it could be somebody in your life, like, Hey, like, have you noticed anything about me? Like, have you noticed any, like, is it like, is it really just a case of the Mondays? And that's why I'm mean when I come into work on Monday, or is it something else? Like, do you notice that I say something more on Mondays? Do you notice I behave different on Mondays? There's all kinds of clues that we can get from the people around us. Cause that was one of the things I just, I looked at my behavior and that's what helped me understand that that thought was really really taking over 
my, my brain space and my ability to be positive about anything. I was focused on this one thing that had nothing to do with me. I noticed that everything that I said was negative. I wasn't, I wasn't sharing any positive reaction to anything like ever. Right. Everything was negative because all I was doing was walking around. And one point somebody said something to me like, man, like you must have really woke up on the wrong side of the bed this week. And I was just like, I'm wait a minute. There's a problem. Like that was my moment of awareness. And then I asked a couple more questions. What do you think? So yeah, professional people can help you out. But if you have people that love and care about you and they're relatively healthy, they may be able to give you some clues that you're just maybe missing. Create a safe place and a safe space for those types of conversations to happen, I think are important. Because I think we might go in the opposite direction of, okay, everybody, tell me what's wrong with me. And, and then you go, wow, that really wasn't helpful or fun. Just because somebody should be able to be that person for you doesn't mean that they are. And that's okay. Just because you, you know, you physically have a mother, father, brother, sister, child, whatever in your life doesn't mean that just because they have a certain label, their opinion means the most or is the most accurate. Being honest with yourself about, do I really have people around me who are capable of being objective and respectful? There is nothing wrong with the answer to that question being no nothing at all wrong with it. Kind of bring it back to the beginning of today with the negativity bias. So if you're going to seek feedback from people that care about you, those people need to recognize that we need to hear positive stuff too. So we're, we're more, we're more mm-hmm. kind of think open to doing that with our kids. Like we're going to give them, you know, but the ratio is like needs to be like four to one. So mm-hmm. if all is, all you hear is negative feedback from someone, then it's really hard for you to think that there's anything good. Those are, I mean, this is another example of how complicated communication can be and how layered it can be, you know, and and I think the goal is just to kind of say, you know, it's not as simple of, I'm just going to say it and you're just going to listen to it, that there's a lot going on and you're not just Mm -hmm. dealing with the person in the moment, you're dealing with the person in their history of experience, both with you and with other people. So when you say, I don't like that you did this, you are probably channeling a lot of these other people that have said similar things to them. And so it could create an experience that you weren't really expecting. When I give feedback, I want that person to be receptive to me. So I got to create a safe place, safe space. And, and what are, mm-hmm. how can I do that before any type of communication like that with people, whether it's, you know, your significant other child, a parent, is that those types of expectations are outlined first so that you can kind of create like a structure to communication and feedback and so that people can feel safe in that experience. So please don't try to start those conversations with the one text that says, Hey, we need to talk. <laughs> right. That's not creating a safe space for anybody. No, that just raises the flags. Um, hope people uh, get something out of this today. Um, like again, as in previous episodes, uh, please share this. Um, if you like it, um, give us feedback, let us know how we're doing ask questions. We do this for you guys. We love to hear from you.